Hi, my name is Diva. Welcome to Mzansi True Crime Diva. I have yet another crime story to tell you all and I'm very excited to be back. Um, you know, I could do the whole life update thing and tell you guys the long story of why I've been gone. But I think from the quality of this video and the sound that of the video as well, I feel like you guys can figure out that, you know, a girl was experiencing some technical difficulties, but obviously I'm back way better than ever. Um, so today, oh no, 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 before we get into the video, please don't forget to stay tuned to the very end where I show you guys the slideshow of people who are currently missing in South Africa. And don't forget to check the description down below for any lifelines, helplines, missing children's line, etc, etc. And I have to warn you guys that this is a crime story. I'll be telling you guys um, something very, very horrible. It's a very horrendous violence, very graphic violence that I'll be describing and I'll be using adult dialogue to do so. So this is intended for a highly matured audience. Please keep that in mind if you do wish to continue watching the video. Um, if this video becomes a bit too much for you, please rather watch the one that I did with Langelitli about the bank robbery. I want to tell you guys today about Joseph Masang, who's mostly known as Soweto's Lover's Lane Killer. Now, this guy... I was I really struggled to understand him. I'm struggling a lot to understand him. I was I uh, couldn't get much background information on him. But what I do know is that his criminal history began when he was just 12 years old. In 1960, he was arrested for robbery and received five cuts with a cane, which was sort of a judiciary punishment for juvenile delinquents back in the day. And then in 1961, he was sentenced to 18 months for theft of a car. In 1963, he was sentenced to two years for the rape and 18 months for robbery, theft, illegal possession of firearms, which ended up being a rather recurring theme. We'll get into that. And he also escaped custody in this year, which led to him being declared a habitual criminal at the age of 16. And in 1964, he was convicted for robbery, but he was released on parole in 1974. In 1977, he began working for Lieutenant Phil Yoon of the Brakpan Police Station as an informant. And in that same year, he stole a .38 Smith & Wesson from the Orlando Police Station. 1979 is the year when he began his killings. On the 9th of January 1979, Sheila and her boyfriend Happy were parked in his red pigeon underneath a tree when Masango approached them and asked them what it is that they were doing there. Happy immediately responded that it was none of his business. Then Masango produced the .38 Smith & Wesson and fired a shot at Happy, killing him instantly. Sheila then attempted to run away. She tried to escape the car, but unfortunately he shot her too, killing her as well. On the 9th of February 1979, Sergeant Andres and his girlfriend Dina were parked in his car in Soweto. They were then approached by Masangu, who suddenly shot Andres three times. When Dina informed him that he had made a great mistake because he had just shot a policeman, he then shot Dina as well, killing her too. He then robbed Andres of his 7.65 service pistol and then he set the car on fire. On the 17th of February 1979, just like the previous couple, Ishmael and his girlfriend Anna were parked in their car in Soweto when they were approached by Matlangu, who shot them both and then dumped the bodies. On the 10th of March 1979, Valerie was picked up by her boyfriend Samuel from her place of work. He then drove her to the Roppers Lounge in Cliptown, where he bought her four milk stouts. They then drove to a police station in Cliptown and then he parked his car there and they made love in the car. Thereafter, they went to an open field between um, some rugby grounds and a golf course in Cliptown. They relaxed there, they enjoyed their milk stout. At some point, they were joined by a group of policemen who, ch who chatted with them and then, you know, they socialized and then the policemen left then at midnight when it was time to go home um they obviously drove to valerie's place but when they got there they parked about five houses away i think they were just still trying to drag the night out they had had quite a nice evening i think they were just still enjoying it a little bit just trying to drag it out and you know hesitating to goodbye that's just what i think now, as they were parked five houses away, um, Samuel reaches for something underneath his seat. That's when Matlangu approaches them. And initially, when Valerie sees him, she's not like, she's not suspecting anything. She's, 
just thinking maybe this guy is gonna pass by but then the guy shines his torch into the car and then suddenly he fires a shot at samuel then you know valerie um panicked she took out her handkerchief and she placed it underneath samuel's face and noticed that it was completely covered in blood she then told matlango to just leave them alone but then matlango opened up the passenger seat he placed his firearm on sam's on samuel's temple and shot him three times Thereafter, he went over to the other side into the driver's seat and he forced Samuel's body over Valerie and then he continued driving, meaning that Valerie had to continue the ride with Mahlangu and with Samuel's body just on top of her bleeding, bleeding heavily. When they arrived at the Zulu section of Clip Town, Masango then stopped the car, he got out and then he went and got Samuel's body. He then dragged it out of the car, but before he left, he searched his body for money and all of those things. And then he went back into the car and continued driving towards a stream between Clip Town and Orlando. He then stopped the car and told Valerie to get out and follow him. When Valerie stepped out of the car, she realized that she was so drenched in blood that she had to wring the blood out of her clothes. She continued following Matlangu. As Valerie climbed down, she left bloody handprints on the cement because the stream had been cemented into an embankment. Matlangu then proceeded to rape Valerie. And when he was done, he told her to follow him back to the car. When they arrived at the car, he told her to just take her things, to take all her belongings, and then he drove away, leaving Valerie stranded, drenched in blood, and raped. Valerie finally managed to get to the nearest house, which was that of Emily Mancha. Immediately when the lights shined in the morning, they went straight to the police station, to the Cliptown police station. Valerie recalled that the man's right eye continually streamed with tears. She then showed the police where he had dumped the body and also in the scene where he had raped her. And in that scene, they found the trail of blood that she had left as when she rang, uh, when she ringed out the blood. They also found her bloody handprints on the embankments of the river. On the 6th of April, 1979, Matlangu took his car to be repaired in a house in Meadowlands. Now, front opposite that house lived Tandi Numailo and Tandi saw Matlangu that day. Later that evening, um, Tandi was fished by her friend Gerald, who took her to an open file close to the Cliptown power station where they made love. Um, they were suddenly disturbed by two men. One of the men smashed a beer bottle against the driver's window, striking Gerald on the head. This obviously led to him bleeding on top of Tandi because he was on top of her. The, the men suddenly opened the door and pushed Tandy out they dragged Tandy out and then he started asking her what she's doing here how old is she where does she live and then Tandy responded that she just doesn't know her age then Matlangu dragged her further into the felt he then looked at her and told her um do you know what a girl is supposed to do now Tandy had managed to get her panties back on but at this point she refused to take her panties off obviously Matlangu then scolded her for wasting his time and then he forced her to lie down he ripped her panties off and he raped her he then stopped and then he turned back to call his friend at this point Tandy saw the opportunity to run and she was barefoot at this point because she left her shoes behind and she left her panties behind as well but she continued running as fast as she could towards the tarred road as she was running towards the tar road she heard gunshots being fired towards the direction of the car that's when she knew that gerald had been killed when she was at the tar road she saw the car being sped off by the two men luckily a taxi did stop for tandy and then it took her to her grandma's house and she told her grandma everything that happened on the 25th of april 1979 pinky who lived in muffle street in dobsonville was fetched by her boyfriend nelson and then they went out they returned at about 11 pm and they parked the car outside of pinky's house they began fondling as lovers do when they were suddenly disturbed by Masangu. Matlangu started asking them what they were doing there, whether they are aware that people are being killed, couples are being killed in the Soweto area. He then asked Nelson where he lives and then he said that he lives in Dobsonville and that's when Matlangu fired a shot. When he fired his shot, it caused the glass to shatter and blood to splatter all over Pinky. He then pushed 
He got into the driver's seat and then pushed Nelson's body over to Pinky's side. Luckily, Pinky managed to get away. She managed to escape and she ran immediately into the house. She then woke her brother up and alerted him of everything that has happened. When they got out, they realized that the car was no longer there. It was just nowhere in sight. The following day, they reported the matter to the police. The police managed to find Nelson's body, but they noticed that his wristwatch was missing. They also found the car but it had been set on fire. On the same evening of Pinky's horrific ordeal, Matlangu returns to Mafu Street of Dobsonville. Now he intended to enter Pinky's house, but accidentally entered the house of her neighbor, Mafa. He began knocking on the door, and before Mafa could open the door, Matlangu struck the door down. He then asked Mafa if he knows who he is. Mafa responded that he does not know who this man is. And then Matlangu switched the lights off. He shined his torch at Mafa and he shot Mafa. Thankfully, the shot did not kill him, but he did require major surgery thereafter. On the 15th of June, 1979, Things got very crazy and this would be the day that would finally put a halt to these killings. In the morning, Matlangu went to Isaac Chamang's house. Um, Isaac Chamang was a Shibin owner and Matlangu had frequented his Shibin and he'd often just fire shots at the backyard in a show of bravado. And in the morning, when he arrived at the house, he pointed his pistol at Xiao Mang's two-year-old son. The toddler grabbed the pistol and he dropped it. When he was done with his show, he informed them that he'll be going back home to change his clothes and to bath and that he'll return an hour and a half later. He did exactly that and he returned with his revolver and pistol. He then gave it to Shamang and told him to hide it. Shamang then hit them in a drum in the backyard. Matlangu then went to Ben Rose to meet up with Lieutenant Phil Yoon. Now, Lieutenant Phil Yoon had become aware that Matlangu was wanted on several charges of murder and he arrested him at 2 o'clock. When he was arrested, Matlangu was wearing the wristwatch that was missing from Nelson's body. Lieutenant Phil Yoon then took Matlangu to the Meadowlands police station where he was handed over to Major Engelbrecht. Major Engelbrecht began interrogating Matlangu who then took him to the house of his friend James Marabedi in Orlando East. They had been friends for about eight years and on occasion in the year 1979, Matlangu would spend the night in James' house. Major Engelbrecht then called for backup and when the detectives arrived, they used a screwdriver to uncover the lid of a disused stove. They then uncovered several boxes of ammunition inside the stove. Matlangu then told Marabedi to hand over a certain firearm to Major Engelbrecht. Marabedi then responded that he knows damn well that he has given Matlangu the firearm on an earlier occasion. Matlangu then became hostile and aggressive. Then Morabedi just struck him on the chin right in front of the detectives. He then showed the detectives some clothes that he had left behind as well as a torch that he had used. No firearm was recovered at Morabedi's house. They then returned to the Meadowlands police station when Major Engelbrecht received a radio message to the house of Isaac Shaumangs, the, the Shibin owner. When they arrived at the house, Matlangu told Shaumang to hand over the firearm that he had earlier asked him to hide and it was handed over with several rounds of ammunition. When they returned to the police station, he was handed over to Captain Swat. He decided that he does not want any legal representation and he wanted to open his entire heart to Captain Swat. That's when he made a 58-page long confession. On the 5th of February 1980, Matlangu's trial began. He was charged with nine counts of murder, two of which were coupled with robbery, one charge of attempted murder, two charges of rape and two charges of unlawful possession of firearms and ammunition. James Morabedi and Isaac Shaumang were charged as accomplices in the illegal possession of firearms and ammunition. And on the 25th of February 1980, when the trial ended, they were acquitted of these charges because they had cooperated with police and granted truthful evidence. Matlangu was sentenced to seven years for each of the rapes, 10 years for the attempted murder of Mafa, two years each on the illegal possession of firearms, and he was handed a death sentence for the nine murders. He attempted to appeal the death sentence, but it failed and he was later executed. It was revealed at his trial that the reason for his eye continuously streaming with tears was because he had been shot in the right eye some years prior. That brings us to the end of this video. Thank you all for tuning in up until this point. 
like i said the story is gonna definitely lead to some discussion in the comments down below so definitely let me know what your questions are i know i have so many questions because i was able to get um you know his criminal history which began at the age of 12 but i wasn't able to find out why he started crime at such a young age what happened in his much earlier childhood why was he shot as well i also wasn't um, able to get information as to why he was shot i'm also very curious to find out why he became a police informant like i've i've realized that people don't become police informants very easily it's it can be a quite a process so um with his criminal history i really really wonder what the story is there and what is his grudge against couples actually why does he have a problem with couples parked in cars i'm asking myself maybe a girl cheated on him with a guy who drove a really nice car or you know does he because uh, he drove a valiant he had a car so it's not like he has a grudge against men who have cars so what, what is his problem really i wish i could truly understand it but mm. At the end of the day, he was fit and sane to stand trial, so clearly he knew what he was doing. He's really just a horrible person. And um, let's talk about the death sentence as well. I think we should talk about that as well in the comments down below. Do you guys think that, you know, um, he should have lived and suffered in jail? Or do you think that it's right that he was killed, that he was executed? Don't forget to stay tuned for the slideshow of people are currently missing in South Africa. Keep an eye out for those faces as per usual. Again, thank you so much. I love you all so much. Thank you.